Reg Ancrum, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. And you are the author of what will be three volumes on Stephen A. Douglas. You've already had one published. Let me bring, uh, bring that up. And here is the cover shot, Stephen Douglas, The Political Apprenticeship, 1833 to 1843. And throughout uh, what I would say is probably going to be the, the next hour or so, uh, we are going to be talking about the life of Stephen A. Douglas that probably a lot of our viewers have heard over the years uh, in terms predominantly, I would say, of the Lincoln-Douglas debates that they heard referenced maybe in their high school history class. And then they probably haven't really heard a whole lot about Stephen Douglas. And frankly, while I read my own share of uh, history, I will admit to being fairly ignorant myself of who he was and why he mattered. So before we start, uh, let me just ask, how was it that you picked uh, Stephen Douglas as someone that you wanted to put all this time and effort into going back over his life? And uh, how, how did he come to your attention that you wanted to become his biographer? Mm -hmm. He was introduced to me by Abraham Lincoln. I had started uh, probably 10 years ago um, serendipitously buying Carl Sandburg's six books on Lincoln. Uh, I simply thought that they would look nice on my bedroom shelf and I bought them to put them there. And I made the mistake or had the good fortune of opening the first book, reading it, then reading the next six books, the next five books. And uh, the books you see behind me are the books that I've read ever since. So I've been on a real uh, bent to read Lincoln. And in the process of reading about Lincoln, um, I, I read a little about Stephen Douglas and found that instead of the 19,000 books written about Abraham Lincoln, uh, maybe a handful, 13 or 14, had been written about Douglas, who was eminently more powerful in the 19th century uh, than Mr. Lincoln until he reached the presidency in uh, 1861. So it, it stirred an imagination in me about who this small guy was. And the second thing was he was from my hometown. He started in Illinois in my hometown of Jacksonville. And he was elected to Congress, ironically, from the town I live in now, which is Quincy on the west side of the state. So those sorts of things came together and, and piqued my interest. I started reading as much as I could about Douglas, uh, realizing there was little written about him. And I decided I could write a biography. And, my intention was to write one volume, and as I got started, uh, I found the uh, the first volume took that first book, and then it became two more volumes after that. My second one is finished. It's been with the publisher now for a couple of months, and the publisher, McFarland Press out of North Carolina, expects to issue it later this year. So work on the third has begun, and uh, find Douglas a fascinating character. We... Uh... We've put the cover up and we will do so again, but it, sometimes it's hard to read on the small screen. So here's a, again, volume one is Stephen Douglas, The Political Apprenticeship, 1833 to 1843. Um, what will be the name of the second volume uh, in your series that you've already written and, and which as you say is already at the publisher? Yes, the uh, title of the second book is Stephen A. Douglas, Western Man. 1844 to 1850. Um, in Jacksonville, he called himself within six weeks of his arrival, a Western man. He found democracy vibrant, although it was kind of in the shadows at the time, but he, find a vi he found a vibrant democracy there and decided that that's where he was going to stay. As he arrived, he had no idea that that would be his destination, but he found significant challenges there. They appealed to him and uh, after that, uh, he just had a rapid succession from one political office to the other until at the age of 27, he was appointed a Supreme Court Justice of Illinois and was assigned at his request to Quincy. And from Quincy, he was elected to Congress uh, two and a half years later uh, in 1843. There's a couple of, in the little bit that I know about Stephen Douglas, and uh, a lot of that comes from you and I talking on the phone previous to this mm -hmm. uh, taping. Uh, is is that he was uh, a man in a hurry, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. As you just said, he was 27 years old when he was on the uh, Illinois Supreme Court. Uh, and he really didn't live that long. And I will also say that it seems, and, and let's talk about how you had said that Lincoln introduced you to Douglas by reading the history of Lincoln. You kind of tripped mm -hmm. over the life of Douglas. It seems... Yes. 
like Douglas and uh, Lincoln's political life, their professional life, were so intermixed that their lives intersected all along the way, uh, long before mm -hmm. the 1858 run for the Senate that set up the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. And then people may forget that then both of them ran for president in 1860, Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Lincoln winning that race. There were actually four candidates in the election of 1860. Um, and when we talk about the 1800s, uh, we, we talk about Lincoln. The only issue that most people focus on, I think, is the question of slavery. We will get into right. that. But I think, I think that's a mistake of history that if all we look at as, is that one issue, that that really sweeps under the rug significant other things uh, that happened and were critical to the formation of the United States as we now know it. Tell us in his political apprenticeship in volume one um, and, and perhaps part of volume two, as, he, as his career developed, um, what role did Douglas play in the development of the United States, uh, you know, from what arguably was a, kind of a, a, a small nation just evolving out of what were the original colonies into this nation that now extends from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Yeah, he, uh, his role was extremely important in the development of the United States. Uh, he was elected to Congress at the age of 30. He died uh, 18 years later at the age of 48. And by that time he had been four times a nominee for the presidency in his party. Uh, first in 1848, he was a leader of what was called the Young America Wing of the Democratic Party. In 1852 and 1856, he yielded to the two candidates, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, and then took the uh, nomination in 1860 and was beaten by Abraham Lincoln. But as you say, he was so important to the development of the country. When he moved to Quincy, believing that he would be elected to Congress very shortly, um, everything west of the Mississippi, which Quincy sits on, was virtually virgin land. There were only two states at the time across the Mississippi, and those were Missouri and Arkansas. Beyond that, there was a lot of territory, much of it wanting to come into the United States, but Congress at the time uh, dissuaded the inclusion simply because Congress felt California was too far away, Oregon was too far away, Texas even was too far away. And so they who wanted to come into the union at the time could not come in. And it was Stephen Douglas who found the ways to bring them in. And it took a great deal of work on his part to compromise. And what he knew going in was that slavery was indeed attached to every single issue that came before the Congress. And that was because the South was extremely jealous of its institution and wanted its protection when they needed it did not want its protection, always pleaded states' rights uh, when they didn't need it. So uh, Douglas found that he had to work strongly with both sides of the aisle, uh, the North that didn't really care that much for slavery, and the South that uh, who, whose uh, institution formed the basis of its capital in the South. In the South. So, and, and I might say Douglas was the guy who created the third section, uh, which was the Western section uh, and that's part of the reason why that became the title of my book, the second book, Stephen Douglas, Western Man, because the West became an extremely important uh, connection for him to be able to negotiate with both North and South and win the Compromise of 1850. Hmm. When we, when we uh, talk about uh, the 1800s, as you just said, uh, there were only two states at that one time, but but then they they did come in. But every time we brought a state in, because there was slavery, uh, the political sides always wanted to balance it. So we typically brought mm -hmm. in one free state with one slave state, and right. that kind of continued on. Uh, so Douglas, wh what were Douglas's talents that he rose so quickly through the uh, from the political wilderness to becoming one of the major leaders in the nation. Uh, was he a great mm -hmm. negotiator? Was he, uh, you know, a, a guy that people just struck up a friendship with easily? What, what kind of an individual do you see him as? 
he had a, a great mastery of politics. He was what I would call really America's first engineer of politics. Uh, for example, he didn't just become an associate justice of the Illinois Supreme Court uh, in 1841. He actually wrote the bill that packed the Illinois Supreme Court so he could get one of the six, well, excuse me, one of the five new appointments to that court. It had been four members at that time, three Whigs and one Democrat. Douglas passes a bill through the House, the Senate. Uh, it's vetoed by the governor and then, then overridden, which made the uh, Illinois Supreme Court nine members. Uh, and then it became six Democrats and three Whigs. And Douglas, who had uh, who, who organized the Democratic Party at the age of 23 in Illinois, and then got himself uh, elected chairman of the Central Committee, the most powerful post in that party, to engineer whatever he wanted after that, he, in 1840, got Thomas Carlin, the governor, to appoint him to the 5th Judicial District in Quincy, basically headquartered in Quincy, knowing that just north of that were 5,700 votes uh, of Joseph Smith's Latter-day Saints Church. And Smith loved Stephen Douglas, who got him out of a bind with Missouri several years earlier as a, as a uh, justice, uh, excuse me, as, as a judge of the, of the circuit court and told his, his uh, flock, his people, that Douglas was a master spirit in their church and his friends were their friends and they would never forget what he did for Joseph Smith. So he chose Quincy and got the governor to appoint him to Quincy because he knew he could count on Smith for those uh, 5,700 votes. What he hadn't thought about was the fact that the state was growing rapidly in the North and the result was three new congressional districts were created at the time he ran for Congress and the state was redistricted so that those votes of the Mormons were cut off from his district. They were located in Nauvoo in Hancock County, just north of Adams County. And the line between the 5th district and the new 6th district cut right between them. And so those votes were actually cut off from Douglas. But he still beat Orville Browning in the 19, excuse me, in the 1843 election and talked the Mormons, Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram, into electing, electing uh, uh, James Hogue in the sixth district. So the Democrats won both the fifth and the sixth district. So we had a, obviously people, you, you're looking at national issues, but as a politician, you also got to make sure that you're holding on to your district and looking at what's going on uh, back there. Wh where was Stephen Douglas born? In uh, Brandon, Vermont, out east. He lived there until he was uh, 16. His mother, uh, Douglas's dad, died when Douglas was less than three months old, so he never knew his father, but greatly venerated him. His father was a doctor in the community, uh, even respected as Douglas was growing up. Douglas was uh, told about his father frequently, uh, how, about, how good a man he was. And so his mother uh, uh, became married, uh, married a gentleman named Gehazi Granger of Clifton Springs, New York, and the family at Douglas's year 16 moved to New York where Douglas attended the Cannon Dig Academy. And did Douglas and, go to college? Uh, well, he, the, the academy would have continued at college level. New York at the time required seven years of study, classical and, and legal studies for a person to become a lawyer. And that was Douglas's ambition, even as young as 16 years old. Uh, he was very much, he became very interested in politics in Cannon Dig Academy because he was really the prime debater for Andrew Jackson, his boyhood hero. And as a result, uh, he entered law, entered the study of law, and stayed until he found out that the state of Ohio required only one year of study of law instead of seven. And so he quickly decided then at 20 years old uh, to head west. And he made Cleveland, Ohio his destination. He got there, he fell deathly ill, was told by his doctors he needed to go home because he was dying. He stayed there and that fall recovered from what, what apparently was a malarial type fever, um, found that, believed that that was a catharsis and changed his life. And he was going on West and um, and making something of himself. So uh, what As I'm curious he had, about is, yeah. so he was born in Vermont, he goes to school in Ohio, mm -hmm. becomes a lawyer. What brought him to Illinois and, and what is really kind of fascinating, I mean, here we are on the Illinois channel, it's how much Illinois history is wrapped up into the, the significance of Illinois history is also the significance of American history. And that you have these yes. two leaders 
uh, from Illinois, Lincoln, who also was born outside the state and came here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have Lincoln and Douglas. And as we said earlier, their, their lives and their careers were intertwined. They were both mm -hmm. ambitious men, both became lawyers. And, and so this struggle between the two, Douglas a Democrat, uh, there was no uh, Republican Party when, when he started his political right. career. There was the Whig Party that I suppose, mm -hmm. would you, I don't know if you'd say the Whig Party became the Republican Party, but, but in any event, the Republican Party emerged. The first time that the Republicans had a presidential candidate was in 1856, four years before right. Lincoln's elected. That was John C. Mm -hmm. Fremont, who had been a military man and kind of a frontiersman. So let's go to uh, Douglas comes to Illinois and he starts to make his career. We said at only the age of 27, he's a member of the Supreme Court. When did, uh, I know Lincoln and here in Springfield at the uh, old uh, state capitol, also part of what it housed is the Illinois Supreme Court where uh, Stephen Douglas was mm -hmm. a justice. And uh, for years then, I, I admit, perhaps ever, ever after, Lincoln would refer to him as Judge Douglas. Yes. But, um, how, let's talk a little bit about how, uh, when did Lincoln and Douglas's career start to intersect and how did they first approach each other? Were they political enemies? Were they admirers of each other? How, what, what was their relationship? They, they, for the long term, they were friends and there was never a, an ill word that one said about the other that wasn't said in the heat of a political campaign, but they were friends. They uh, actually dated the same woman, same women actually in Springfield, including Mary Todd, who became Mrs. Lincoln. Um, what I call the first great debates in 1837 and 38 in Springfield, uh, they were both lawyers. They both moved to Springfield in April of 37 um, and and, um, you know, Lincoln moved in with uh, Joshua Speed. Uh, Douglas lived in a hotel for a while and then uh, uh, found other residents. But they, they were together then. Their first meeting really was politically, and that was in, uh, let's see, 1834, at a time when Douglas was writing a bill to try to kick John Hardin, who was Lincoln's fast friend. Uh, Hardin was considered the most the strongest Whig in the state of Illinois at the time. He was the nephew of Henry Clay, who founded the Whig Party. And so Hardin is the prosecuting attorney from Jacksonville. Uh, Douglas, who had landed in, in Jacksonville and had gotten his certification to, the, to practice law uh, there, um, decides he wants to be prosecuting attorney. And he, a remarkable way to do it, he found out that one of the Democrats who helped Hardin uh, with his appointment as prosecuting attorney, uh, had failed to get Hardin's reciprocity when he went back to Hardin and said, help me with my re-election to the legislature. Hardin simply said no. And so he found, so Douglas found out that William Wyatt was highly aggravated about that and told Wyatt he could help him with a little vengeance. And what he did, he wrote a bill that changed the way state's attorneys were, pro were appointed. And that bill passed and uh, Hardin was kicked out of office and Stephen A. Douglas, at the age of 21, was appointed to that office. And then he gets elected to the state legislature um, and, and serves with Lincoln. In 1834, uh, he was working on that bill for, to, for the prosecution appointments to be changed, the method uh, prosecutors' appointments to be changed. And Lincoln was serving his first term in the legislature. And he didn't think a lot of Douglas when he saw him buttonholing and yanking on collars and so on to get this bill passed. And he, Lincoln literally elbows his seatmate and tells his seatmate that, talking about Douglas, he said, that's the least man I ever saw. And of course, he referred to his own height. That's what he was referring to. Lincoln was 6'4". Stephen Douglas was a full foot shorter five foot four inches and Lincoln could say that's the least man he ever saw and he didn't think about much about Douglas's bill in fact he voted against it twice uh, when it was overridden and came back to the legislature and then Douglas at the age of 21 uh, kicks out the most powerful wig of the state from his office and gets himself appointed prosecuting attorney this brand new lawyer uh, in the eight county uh, first judicial district which at that time was uh, basically headquartered in, uh, in Jacksonville. 
So they got along well. And, um, and I think they, Lincoln they basically well saw life. his political skills and realized this is not a man to be underestimated. He, he never again underestimated Douglas. Douglas never underestimated Lincoln. In fact, uh, the one thing he talked about when he formed his party was the idea that they need to keep an eye on Abraham Lincoln. He, he greatly appreciated Lincoln's intelligence. Uh, he often said he wished he had the, the oratory that Lincoln could pop off the top of his head. And Douglas chagrined, loved Lincoln's stories, but hated that he couldn't repeat them or, or he had no way he could come up with the kinds of stories that won the affections for, for Lincoln. But what really won the affection for Douglas was his personality. He was a very gregarious young man. Uh, he had a capacious memory that would remember a person whose children he might have kissed on the forehead 10 years earlier. And later when he would meet them, he would ask the parents, how are Billy and Sally? He just remembered people and he knew that the most important word in the English language for anyone was their first name. And so he remembered it. Uh, he said he loved the democracy he found here. He uh, slept with people in their homes. He ate their corn dodgers. He dressed as they did. He loved to be on the Jacksonville Square on Saturday mornings when the farmers would come in and uh, they would buy their staples and then drink in the afternoon at the uh, six saloons on the Jacksonville Square and watch horse races on the square during the day. Douglas was um, much akin to the Western people that he met in Jacksonville. I want to go back to uh, one of the titles we have here, uh, subtitles we have, is How, How Douglas Changed America. Uh, slavery had been an issue ongoing and, and was out throughout uh, Douglas's life and, and throughout Lincoln's mm -hmm. life. We had South Carolina almost, uh, which led the Civil War by being the first state. They fired on uh, Fort Sumter. But uh, South Carolina trying to leave, leave the uh, Union earlier on when Andrew Jackson was uh, mm -hmm. president. So we almost had uh, the Civil War come, uh, you know, 30 years before uh, the 1860s. So when, when Douglas is coming up, obviously there was the issue of slavery, which was very divisive within uh, the country, even in the 1830s. But by the same time, the other issue was, again, as we kind of touched on this a little bit, westward expansion. What did, what did Douglas, uh, did he have a role in westward expansion and how significant a role did he play in it? Yeah, he, he not only had a role, he really took on his own part the most important role. As he was elected and uh, during that campaign in 1843 against Orville Browning, uh, he told his uh, constituents, the citizens of his judicial district, which the congressional district had the same boundaries, uh, that he wanted to build what he called an ocean-bound republic that went from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And he said, also, I will cut out red lines on the map, which those red lines represented interest by foreign countries like Britain, interested in Texas, uh, France, still interested also in Texas, but also in Louisiana. And, um, and Spain, which had strong interests throughout the South. So he was going to uh, build a continental uh, uh, nation and remove the foreign interests in that nation. And he did exactly that. Uh, that one of the first things he did in getting to Congress in 1843, um, in December of 1843, was look at the, the uh, problems of Texas. Texas wanted to come into the Union. The Union didn't want them because John C. Calhoun from South Carolina said, this will be a slave state. Uh, obviously, there were many senators who had to approve a treaty to bring Texas in who would not want that to happen. And of course, the South did. Uh, the problem was it was an independent republic. And so it took a treaty to annex Texas to the United States. A treaty had to be passed in the US Senate and it took a, an extraordinary majority to pass the treaty. It just wasn't going to happen. Because, Cal, because of Calhoun's promise that it would be a slave state. Uh, Douglas did a, two things among many other things to bring Texas in, and it was Douglas who brought it in. Um, number one, he said, let's, pa let's pass a joint resolution in the two houses, which simply meant it would take only a majority vote instead of an extraordinary majority to bring it in. That's what he did. The second thing he did to ameliorate the South was he, in the legislation, um, made it 
possible that Texas could be div divided into five states and they could be slave states. Um, and we could talk about how that could happen, but those states could be slave states. That certainly appeased the South and it ameliorated the North because in a sense, what Douglas did was say, slavery would be confined in this one large state. So he brings in Texas, uh, he works to expand the nation. It was the mantra of Andrew Jackson that he had loved since, a little, since he was a little boy, that was, the expansion of the nation is the expansion of liberty. Douglas believed that. And so he started his work first with Texas, then working uh, with California and the then the Mexican session, half a million square miles of the country in that session, and he brought them in. Uh, the interesting thing was, Terry, and you alluded to it, was each time he worked to bring a state in, he had the North saying no, and he had the South saying yes. Calhoun once said, wherever the flag was unfurled, the South has a right to go because its men had fought for it. And certainly uh, Jefferson Davis led a regiment in the Mexican War. So the South, uh, Southerners were part of that war. And Calhoun's thought was piece of terror. That's what Douglas faced. And he found the ways to bring disparate Northerners and disparate Southerners together to pass the laws that allowed the entry of those states. So we see in that example, which actually I had not heard before, that uh, by, by coming up mm -hmm. with this idea that Texas could become as many as five states. He threw mm -hmm. a political bone to those who wanted to expand slavery. Uh, but by the same token, as you just said, uh, it kind of appeased the Northern interest. And I suppose that's really one of the, one example, uh, there's probably so many, but one example that shows his political wiliness, his political cleverness, mm -hmm. and why he could get things done because he, he could, as we say today, think out of the box. So he got mm -hmm. beyond the loggerheads of uh, is it A or B, uh, and he could come up with it was uh, A.5, you know, or something mm -hmm. to, yeah. to use perhaps yeah. a bad example. Um, yeah. When with, uh, with the, so we had the expansion, and every time we had the expansions, we just talked, uh, slavery was something, uh, the expansion or lack of it uh, had to be balanced. Mm -hmm. What, you know, one thing I, I want to ask, uh, uh, what were his thoughts on slavery? We know what Lincoln's thoughts more or less are, although we still debate that. Was, was Douglas looking at slavery as merely a political issue that had to be dealt with? Uh, what do we know what his own political beliefs were? Did he own slaves? Was he in favor of slavery or... Did he, and, mm -hmm. and the other thing, you might touch on your answer because it came to me before. Lincoln wrote a lot. Uh, we, I mean, we have his prose, and, and I would suggest if one wants, they could read uh, Lincoln's speech at the Cooper's Union, uh, which the great thing about that where he gives mm -hmm. a long speech, but you can read his mm -hmm. words. This is not a speech writer yes. doing it. And so you can see how Lincoln's mm -hmm. mind worked. And I think from reading that, as I did uh, one evening, that you could just see how clever he was and how analytical right. Lincoln's brain was, that he could take these issues and, uh, and take the arguments on both sides apart. Was, uh, do we have anything similar in the writings? Uh, do we have writings of Douglas? Do we know and can we read how his mind worked and how analytical perhaps he was as well? And, and again, uh, where did Douglas personally stand on the question of slavery? Yeah, I uh, got a couple of good questions there. The first, uh, he did not write. He did write letters and there are letters available. In fact, University of Chicago has his collection of letters and so on. Uh, they're pretty massive, but most of them were personal letters to family, friends, and so on. Many were political, but those didn't really make it into the history books. Um, and University of Chicago is closed right now, so I've been able, unable to get up there to, to go through those. those. But, um, but the fact was what Douglas said was recorded, and, and I can't praise enough the Congressional Globe, which is online. Uh, as Douglas entered the Congress in 1843, the, um, the transcriptions of the speeches in Congress were being taken by Gales and Seton, who published the Congressional Globe. And 
And they're wonderful because they do answer your question, Terry, about do we know what Douglas felt about slavery? And they are in that record. Uh, in March of 1850, Douglas was trying to pass the Compromise of 1850, extremely hot. The North cared nothing about it. The South cared nothing about it. But Douglas, within three weeks, got every bill passed after Clay had been unable to in trying for over eight months. And he left exhausted, resigned from the Senate, and left because he had to recover his strength. But what what Douglas in that recording in his in a two-day speech that he made in March, I think reveals uh, something about his thoughts about slavery. Keep in mind, Douglas was a great compromiser, and a compromiser doesn't reveal what he has in the way of chits in his pocket. If he needs some leverage, he'll pull a shit out of the pocket, put it on the table, and hope that it satisfies one side. When the other guy needs something, another chit comes out of the pocket and satisfies the next guy. So Douglas wasn't really um, very public in what he felt about slavery. We can talk about that in a, a little further, but the point I'm making about his speech in 1850 was I think it revealed something about what he really felt about slavery. Uh, in, the, in the passion of a moment, he was making his speech. Jefferson Davis, a senator from Mississippi, had been highly critical of Douglas because Davis did not believe Douglas was providing enough protection for the for the South's slave institution. And, and Jefferson Davis asked Douglas to yield the floor on a point of personal privilege. Douglas, who usually was gracious enough always to do that, would not do it on this day. Uh, he would not yield the floor to Davis. And what he said to Davis then was, and I'm quoting here, if slavery is a blessing, it's your blessing. If it's a curse, it's your curse. On you rests all the responsibility. And what he was saying there, he was quite proud that Illinois came in as a free state, but tried to become a slave state. He was very proud of the fact that Illinoisans at a referendum in 1824 uh, turned down the idea of making Illinois a slave state. Douglas was proud of that and said that any number of times. He said that on the floor of the Senate. Another thing he pointed out, uh, if you think about the fact that the South wanted to maintain that balance in, sl in slave and free states, it was Douglas who said in that March of 1850 speech that the states that remained to be brought into the Union would all be free states none would be a slave state. And he told the South, you better get used to that fact. Douglas was actually right. He had died before the last came in. There were 17 more states to come in, Utah being the last of them. And Utah came in last because it had the so-called twin pillars of infamy. One was polygamy and the other was slavery. And so Utah take a, took a long time to come in. But Douglas was exactly right. And he was really kind of right for the wrong reason. What he learned when he arrived in Jacksonville, he was a blank slate. Uh, what he learned about politics, culture, voting, everything else, he learned in Jacksonville, Springfield, and Quincy, the three major towns he lived in. And what he found even in an enlightened community like Jacksonville, where the first college in Illinois was created in 1829 by seven young Yale Divinity students, all abolitionists uh, was that white men, and they were the only people who could vote in Illinois, white men did not want slavery, but the reason was they did not want blacks anywhere around. Uh, they feared the competition of their labor, the, price, the cost of their labor, thought their own labor costs would decline. And so the result was Douglas knew that even with Wilmot Proviso, which said there will not be slavery in the great 500,000 square mile Mexican session, Wilmot himself said, it's not because I dislike slavery, it's because I dislike blacks. And he reported that directly in the, uh, reported directly in the Congressional Globe. So to answer your question, take a long time to answer your question. There is writing that Douglas has about him, but it's his own words and the beauty of that. I, I love quotations in the biographies I do because I think they personalize who these men are and the well, writings of the congressional words. It's better. So many times exactly. historians, you get historians who look at the same figure and come up with different conclusions about their life because they're interpreting the record 
uh, differently. But if we can, yes. I mean, that's where I love and why I asked. If we can look at someone's yeah. own writing, the thoughts that came out of their brain and they put on paper, uh, then them speaking about their own life is, I think, mm -hmm. the, the best evidence of what they, how they viewed the world. Yeah. So to that, and Anna, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, no, I was going to say to that, to that, the uh, the Congressional Globe shows the power of Douglas. He was the most powerful Democrat in the country in the 1850s, bar none. Uh, when he ran against President, when he ran against Mr. Lincoln for the Senate in 1858, the president, who was a Democrat, James Buchanan, sent minions into Illinois, had them working and planning with Lyman Trumbull, who was the other senator from Illinois, to try to get Lincoln's election. Uh, by the legislature in 1858. Uh, Douglas beat back the President of the United States as well as Trumbull and Lincoln uh, in 1858 to win back, well, to keep his seat uh, from Illinois in the U.S. Senate. Very powerful guy. So uh, the interesting thing was I read 2,000 pages Reggie, of the Congressional Globe. On the question, yes, because please. this is important, I'm not sure if we yeah. answered it. Yes. Would you say, and maybe, uh, I understand it may be a nuanced answer and it's not a yes or a no, but was, was Douglas in favor of slavery or opposed to slavery or, or was he agnostic and, and he just looked at uh, slavery as a political issue that had to be dealt with politically? I, I think your perception is exactly right on the last point. Uh, he, he, he actually called slavery an abstraction and the reason, and certainly 4 million men and women in bondage is not an abstraction, but in the Congress, he believed it was an abstraction. He believed Congress really didn't have the authority to act on, on the slave issues. Uh, he ultimately said the Northwest Ordinance was really unauthorized by the, con by the con uh, Constitution. The Missouri Compromise, which drew a line across the base of, of Missouri and said that line was forever, meaning that South slavery would be south of that line, freedom north of it, um, that that was unconstitutional. And, and if you read what he wrote about it, you can see his logic. So from that point of view, he believed that really slavery had no place being argued in the halls of Congress. It was a domestic institution and the constitution actually in its provision for equal footing said that any state had the right to any institution of the original 13 states, 12 of them, Vermont was the only one that didn't, Douglas was very proud of that, but 12 of them actually had slavery and six later on uh, abolished slavery. But any state that came in afterward had the right to the slave institution. That's how Illinois in 1824 uh, actually put it on the ballot to see whether or not it would become a slave state, state after it came in six years earlier, a free state. Because of the equal footing provision of the Constitution, Illinois had the right to slavery if its people wanted it. And Douglas believed that that was all the Constitution provided for. That also served as the basis for his popular sovereignty theories, which proved true, uh, proved correct. Um, in, uh, in 1850, popular sovereignty began with California, Nevada, U and uh, Utah, and Arizona. Uh, Douglas is back in the news uh, because <laughs> his, his image and that of Lincoln uh, hang on both sides of the House chamber uh, in the Illinois State Capitol. And there is a discussion now of taking Douglas's uh, portrait down and right. removing his statue from the, the grounds of the Capitol. So I'd like you, as a historian, as someone who is so well read about all these details, and obviously you, you know, have, you're, you're also a period of your, a person of your own period in time, and you look at these issues like <laughs> everyone else does. Mm -hmm. um, do. Did Douglas do something where he deserves to hang in the House chamber, or does he deserve to be removed, one? And two, mm -hmm. what do you make of this uh, latter-day movement of uh, doing away with pictures and some would say an effort to erase history if not rewrite history? Right. Very good points. Uh, to your first point, what I would say is in the conversation that I think fortunately we are having about unequal justice in this country, 
Uh, Douglas should be considered. It, uh, he, he did espouse racism. Uh, he espoused white supremacy. Um, and those are issues that uh, we no longer believe valid in our country. Uh, I, so I would say he certainly should be looked at from that perspective. On the other hand, as you say, there are nuances in history that had exactly the same things, even in the communities in which he lived. The, uh, for example, the second president of Illinois College, uh, Julian Sturdivant, which was that abolitionist college in Illinois, the first college in Illinois, uh, believed blacks should be free to do what God prepared them to do, which was to wash our clothes and carry our water. That's a white supremacist statement. So uh, to boil that part of it down, I think, I think Douglas is worthy of examination in the discussion today. And uh, I don't know whether that discussion will say, let's take his picture down or not, but I think Douglas deserves the at least the discussion because it sounds like we're going to take that picture down. The other part of your question was, did he do something that would merit his picture remaining there? Uh, what I would point to is, is he is the man who singularly organized the western half of this continent. Um, certainly, we need to look at, you know, where he came from, from a uh, cultural standpoint. Uh, but there is certainly merit in, in appreciating a man who, you know, uh, built the nation that President Lincoln, over four years of bloody war, preserved. Um, I would say on your question about um, the discussion we're having about removal of statues and are we removing history, I felt that way until November of last year. And I know the moment it happened to me when I thought, when I began to think differently, I heard a, an African-American woman who pointed out that when she was a child, she was in a car, in the backseat of a car driven by her father and her mother was with them. Her father was a professor at a, at a, uh, at a university in the South. They were driving up the street in Charlottesville and she looked and saw statues of, you know, Robert E. Lee and, and other Confederate uh, generals. And her thought at that moment, this five-year-old child thought, these are the men who wanted to make me a slave. That hit me just in at the right moment in the right way to say that, you know, th they were great generals and certainly deserve historic recognition. Uh, but I, I agree, I have come to agree with others that their statues should be placed in locations where context can be given to them. Uh, my view of the context was that they were traitors to their country. Um, Robert E. Lee was educated by American taxpayers at West Point. What he learned to become a great general, he learned there. Uh, he was an engineer. Taxpayers throughout the country paid for his schooling. Uh, he went south. He left his nation and he killed uh, his fellow citizens. So that should be explained in my estimation. It's not a destruction of history. It should be explained properly. And a statue that can put fear and intimidation in the heart of a child uh, is not a proper way to display uh, a man who was a traitor to his country who sought to enslave uh, human beings. I suppose part of this conversation that we have are having as a uh, society is mm -hmm. uh, does does a statue denote honor i mean certainly in a lot of cases that i think mm -hmm. is the intention sure uh, and and it would be hard to argue i think at least uh, from my standpoint uh why do we honor if that's a, the right word uh those who fought against the united states as confederate soldiers on the other hand, the other side of that uh, argument, or at least one one part of it, there's more than A and B in this argument, I think. The other <laughs> is, uh, to what extent do we diminish our national awareness when we uh, tend to erase those awareness of who were people? And, and in part, mm -hmm. that's why I think we wanna be doing this interview on Stephen Douglas. It, it is, we're, we don't do this interview necessarily to honor Douglas, to say that uh, everything he believed in was correct, but that there were certain people along the path of history, um, good and bad. Adolf Hitler was an historical figure. We don't, we don't honor him uh, at all, but by the same token, we damage ourselves if we don't know who he was, what he did, and the impact he had on the world. To yes. that end, and, and Hitler is the extreme, 
Um, I worry about the fact that we have this rush to judgment, that we are applying standards of our time to historical figures and then saying they were all bad when they weren't necessarily all bad. There was like so many of us, uh, none of us mm -hmm. are saints and all of us are sinners. And then I suppose it all depends to what extent do we emphasize what impact did any of us have uh, through the course of our life on the world uh, as we transpired through it? So mm -hmm. that's, that's how I kind of see this debate. And I just worry about, are we damaging our national awareness of history and who the players were by this um, effort to say, well, we're going to remove these statues. Maybe we should. But then you also see, and I think a great historical illiteracy, which unfortunately plagues the nation, where you have people tearing down the statues of Grant, who one would argue mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln could not have freed the slaves were it not for President Grant. So why don't, right. why don't you give us a little bit of your thoughts? Yeah, my, my thought very simply is that we should not erase history. We should know about General Lee, and we should know about Alexander Stevens. Uh, we should know about... Uh, uh, the three men who planned the secession starting in 1856, and it came to fruition. Uh, so we should know those subjects, but we should know the truth of those subjects. Um, what I what I would say from your your discussion of the overall picture is that you know President Lincoln uh, conducted a, a tremendous war to try to preserve the Union, and that's the way it started. Uh, Douglas introduced amendments to uh, make slavery. Uh, to, to have uh, to, to appeal to the slave states to stay in the Union. Uh, Congressman Corwin introduced two amendments which would have made slavery permanent in this country, and the second, make it unamendable, which means only by revolution again could that have been ended. Uh, that actually had gone to the states, and Illinois was one of the states that voted in, in its behalf. And President Lincoln in his inaugural talked about, he understood that was at the time moving through Congress, and he supported the idea of trying to hold the union together. Anti-slavery or emancipation occurred as Lincoln continued to grow during the war uh, and the Emancipation Proclamation came January 1st of 1863. But here, here's what I would say as an overall part of this. You know, Abraham Lincoln prosecuted that war successfully. Uh, he was assassinated on Good Friday, April 15th of 1865 and resurrected in every pulpit in the nation on Easter Sunday, two days later. Really, and I believe if we have a saint in our country, a civil saint, it is Abraham Lincoln. I love Lincoln. Uh, he's, he's the guy I started with and the guy I, I will finish with. But uh, if, if there is a good and bad, and there is in politics just as in religion, there's a yin and a yang. Uh, President Lincoln was the good and the man he pursued for 26 years unsuccessfully Stephen Douglas ends up being the bad in history. That's just the way we, we kind of look at it. Uh, was he really that bad? Uh, I let people make their own judgments. One of the uh, great pieces of misinformation in history is whether or not he did own slaves. In fact, much of the discussion that goes on right now is whether he owned slaves. And what I can report to you is that he, in fact, did not own slaves. He is said to have owned a slave plantation in Mississippi, 900 acres operated by 123 slaves with 30 more slaves on the, on the way when the uh, actual owner died, who was his father-in-law. His father-in-law, Robert Martin, the day after Douglas married Martha Denny Martin in April of 1847, told Douglas he was gonna give him that plantation. Uh, Douglas told Martin, that's not the kind of property a northern man cares to own, and Douglas did not accept, he declined the property. Uh, a couple of years later, when Robert Martin died, his will uh, left the plantation to his daughter, Douglas's wife, uh, with the understanding that she would uh, operate the plantation herself. Uh, he, The way he phrased it, she would sell it if she had no children, she would sell it, and then the proceeds would be used to return the slaves to Africa and they would take with them any proceeds left over after that expense. Uh, Douglas did not own slaves. Uh, his wife owned a plantation. Uh, they did have two children and that plantation then went to the two children. Uh, Douglas, however, did not own slaves. To his discredit, he accepted income during his lifetime 
from that plantation for so-called management. It's pretty clear that he really had very little to do with the management of the plantation, but his father-in-law did, in his will, leave Douglas 20% of the income of the plantation. Uh, Douglas, I understand, did take it, and that certainly is not to his credit that he benefited then from slavery. Uh, my judgment is he had flaws. Uh, Mr. Lincoln used the N-word twice in Ottawa. Should that erase him from history? Certainly not. Uh, that's the nature of who people were in that time. So you're right. We need to look at the the history of our, of that time in the period of that time, in the way people were in that time. And Douglas lived in the same time. You know, when I hear people say, well, the nation has never been as divided as it is today, I, I just think, well, of course it, of course it has. We, course, we had yeah. a civil war, for heaven's sakes. We were shooting each yeah. other in mass. Um, I look back, and you and I can remember the uh, even the Vietnam War. I mean, we were terribly mm -hmm. divided back then. When we had the mm -hmm. shooting at Kent State, there were a lot of people that said, good, it's about time that they shot those students. And you can yeah. almost get into that emotion because we see this today with the rioting and all in the streets. That So mm -hmm. um, I think it's in the broad context, what we are doing in this interview, what you've done in your writings, and, and you're going to be working, I guess, on your third volume here. But... Um, is to tell the story so we can put our own lives into some context and the life of our nation and how did we evolve to where we are and what were these yeah. issues and to say that we were never as divided it's just not accurate uh this nation has right. always been divided over significant issues it probably always will be this the uh, american revolution was the first civil war you had a uh, father and son benjamin franklin his son went with england and and benjamin franklin went with uh, obviously the freedom of america to breaking away so i'll leave it at that but i i think when people want to look at these issues Hopefully, you and I are offering and, and other writings some context for this period of time that is certainly divisive, uh, but it is not unique in the annals of American history. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's good that we remember that we're all Americans and we're in the broad scheme of things on the same side. We, I think we all want to have liberty and freedom. Hopefully, we do. Uh, let's, let's go back to something that I've always been kind of confused about. We had the Lincoln-Douglas debates of the 1850s, 1858. Um, what, what confuses me is that back then we did not have direct election of senators. We had uh, senators were elected by the state legislature. Why then did Lincoln and Douglas bother to go around the state to, and give seven different debates of three hours each on the question of slavery when the only people they had to be convinced to be elected were those in the state legislature and not the general population? Yeah, very good question. Uh, it was because the legislators who were going to be electing this the U.S. senator were actually elected in local places like Jacksonville. And so they had to appeal to people who were going to be electing the legislators who were electing them. And that's the reason, for example, that James Buchanan started firing all the patronage workers in Illinois who had gotten their jobs, thanks to Stephen Doug, if he could get rid of the postmaster in Quincy, which he did, Austin Brooks, he fired him and replaced him with a so-called knight. They were the people who supported James Buchanan. He then had local people who could influence the local legislator to vote instead of Douglas uh, to vote for Lincoln. So the reason they conducted their appeals to people instead of to legislators themselves was because the legislators themselves were elected by the people. When we look at this period of time, the life of Stephen Douglas, um, one of the things that uh, is shocking, I think, uh, is that here's this man who lived his life in a hurry, and we mm -hmm. talked about that, how he rose quickly to positions of high power, he was so significant. So uh, he wins election, defeats Lincoln in 1858, goes to the Senate. On the other hand, the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, made the nation aware of who of who Abraham Lincoln was. 
because mm -hmm. these were interestingly, and this of course before television or radio, but because of all the newspaper coverage of the debate, right? Obviously, this was a the the history of slavery, which had always been in our American politics, as you and I have already discussed, was coming to a boiling point. And so that's where everyone focused on the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And it, it brought attention to both Lincoln and Douglas. Uh, as I alluded to the Cooper Union speech in New York City, I think they brought Lincoln out to say, is this, is this guy for real? And they found out at the, at the Cooper Union speech that he was, that he, he wasn't just some backwoods hick, that he really had quite a good mind. So we go into 1860, uh, Lincoln and, and Douglas again uh, are in competition. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fascinating. I don't know of two other political figures whose, whose lives ran so parallel to each other. And, right. and Lincoln wins election. What is shocking is that w one would have expected Douglas then to have played such a major role in the period of time that Lincoln was president. And yet just, uh, what, three months after Lincoln is sworn into office, Douglas dies at the age of 48. Uh, Correct. Yeah. What, what did he die of, number one? And then I'm going to ask you to speculate. How might America had been different, or how might the Lincoln presidency been different if it would have been had had Douglas lived? Yeah, um, he died of rheumatoid arthritis. He was actually paralyzed for the last month of his life, but he was still dictating letters at that time uh, to Virgil Hickox, who was the uh, chairman of the Democratic Party. So he was still very much involved in politics. Uh, did he know he was dying? That's not really clear, but on the morning he died, when he was asked about uh, religion and so on and so forth, he declined an offer from the bishop, the Archbishop of Chicago, to be baptized Catholic. Waited his death. Um, you know, by the time he ran against Abraham Lincoln, he knew he would not win the election. Uh, you can look back to 1856, had John C. Fremont, whom you mentioned, Terry, as the, as the first Republican candidate, the party was only less than two years old at the time, would have won the presidency had he taken Pennsylvania and Illinois' electoral votes. That total 37 votes would have swung the election from James Buchanan to John C. Fremont. The South saw that. That's what started driving the South toward secession as early as 1856. The North was becoming much more populous. The number of congressional seats was growing in the North. It was not growing in the South. And the South knew then they were losing the control they had had since, gosh, the Constitutional Convention of the central government. And the South planned to go out. They were going out and they did go out. Douglas knew because of that 1856 election, and he predicted it in 1858 that Lincoln would be the candidate who won the 1860 election. Because he knew the North would win that election, uh, he decided the only way he might win is to get it thrown into the House of Representatives, which would decide on the basis of the electoral votes. And he was not unhappy that uh, Bell and Breckinridge announced their candidacy for the presidency because he believed that it would be possible he figured he'd take the plurality in the Democratic vote, it would be possible then to get them to throw their electoral votes to him rather than to elect uh, what was called a, a an abolitionist Republican, even though Lincoln was not at that point an abolitionist Republican. Uh, but in any case, that meant that Douglas knew he's going to lose the election. And in October, when the statewide elections were uh, being conducted and Douglas was campaigning heavily on the trail, the first candidate really for the presidency to do that. When he saw the Republicans winning statewide elections in the North, he knew it was over for him. Douglas, to his great credit, I think, uh, took his campaign to the South, not for Stephen Douglas, but he took his campaign to the South for Union. He campaigned for Union. He was actually in Mobile, Alabama when he learned that Lincoln had won the election um, and, and accepted it. And he uh, he went back to Washington. He Lincoln might be interested in talking to him. Douglas believed Lincoln probably wouldn't be interested in talking to him because of the exhaustive campaign they had just run. But he did go. He spent two hours with Lincoln. Uh, Mr. Lincoln said he was going to call out 75,000 troops. Um, and Douglas said, I would suggest 250,000. I know these people in the South and 75 will not be enough. 
to your to the last part of your question, which was, would Lincoln have been helped by Douglas? Uh, number one, he was helped while Douglas was alive. President elect Lincoln asked Douglas to go back to Illinois and talk General John A. Logan out of taking Southern Illinois into the Confederacy, which is what Logan had intended to do. Douglas did talk Logan into staying with the Union. While he was there, he also talked the state legislature, which was significantly uh, Democratic, many of them Southern, uh, former Southerners, uh, into funding the state's cost of materiel and uh, and volunteers who had to be whose expenses had to be paid by the state. The federal the federal government at that time had no federal army. They had soldiers who who uh, policed the frontier and so on, but there was no federal army army per se. So so Douglas did help Douglas help President Lincoln in his lifespan in the last uh, couple of months of his life, and certainly uh, he told Lincoln at that meeting that I mentioned that he intended to be the loyal opposition. He continued to be the leader of the Democratic Party, but in support of the war effort, uh, he would do everything he could to support President Lincoln uh, as he conducted the war. So yes, he would have fully supported President Lincoln. You know, again, we talk about the history of the country and how many times it's Illinois that's playing the, the lead role in the history. Mm -hmm. and, and in this instance, where you have in 1860, again, there were four candidates, but you had the uh, Douglas, uh, the candidate of the Democratic Party, and Lincoln of the Republican Party, uh, both mm -hmm. from Illinois. Mm -hmm. And then as war breaks out in the spring of 1861, again, back then, we didn't elect uh, or we didn't inaugurate presidents until March the 4th. So Lincoln Correct. doesn't become president until March 4, 1861. But uh, the other person then that arises is Ulysses Grant who comes down from Galena mm -hmm. to Springfield and gets a commission. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. And here it's Grant that yeah. continues to have one victory after another and uh, ends up leading the Union forces ultimately to, to a victory in the Civil War. Um, had Douglas won the 1860 election and not Lincoln, I'm going to guess that war would have been averted perhaps at that time, because uh, it seemed to me the election of 1860 was the South last gasp as far as maintaining slavery. And once Lincoln was elected, they knew our interests are over, Lincoln is going to be against us, and so they left the Union and we had the Civil War. Had Douglas won, the Civil War would have been at least averted, perhaps, through his uh, presidency, but ultimately we either would have had a, a Civil War later, or perhaps we would have led to a period of time, as some other historians have speculated, that had there not been a Civil War, the uh, slavery as an institution would have died out of its own accord, uh, and we can guess when, 1890s, 1900. Uh, but as the world continued to modernize and let's say leave the dark ages, because America was not the first country to have slavery. I mean, slavery had been part of a life of humanity on the planet going, I mean, in the Egyptian period and perhaps before. Anyway, so had Douglas won uh, the election of 1860 and lived, do you imagine would we have averted uh, a civil war from what you could uh, ascertain? I, I really could not say. What I, what I can say is that on your premise of Lincoln and slavery, Lincoln's interest at the beginning of the Civil War was simply to save the Union. You know, he wrote this beautiful letter to uh, Horace Greeley, if I could save the Union by, by freeing all slaves, I would. If I could save the Union by freeing no slaves, I would. His whole interest was wrapped up in preserving the Union. Uh, it wasn't really until 1862, starting in June, he began to think about the Almighty. The Almighty has may have other purposes for this war. It, it, it the Almighty could end it at any time, and yet he doesn't. He must have his own purposes. Lincoln came to see those other purposes as the sin of slavery, and that's when he started his effort and announced on September 22nd that in 100 days he would issue an Emancipation Proclamation. He came to the conclusion that slavery indeed was the, the concern, even from a practical sense, for the Civil War. And, and I would say, uh, Terry, that you know this nation began in slavery, as you know, 
And in fact, the founders at the Constitutional Convention wrote slavery into the Constitution. So, um, and, and Patrick Henry was absolutely livid about that. And he, and he writes to George Washington, who was the chairman of the Constitutional Convention, why in the world, when you had the chance to end the sin of slavery, the only stain on the Republican robe of this country, didn't you do it? And Washington wrote back the beautiful answer, which Lincoln reflected very well, and Stephen Douglas reflected. Washington writes Patrick Henry, um, I wish the document had been more perfect, but it was the best we could do at the time and get a nation. He said, it was the best we could do at the time and get a nation. The fight over slavery between the two sections in the Constitutional Convention was terrible. It, 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 they were six weeks, they couldn't make one move without slavery popping into the issue. So, uh, but what Washington added to his last part, his last sentence in that letter was, and the fact that we have made it amendable means at some it will end. That was what Lincoln looked at to say the founders put it on a path to extinction. Unfortunately, the cotton gin made it tremendously economically feasible for the South to continue it. And then when the South saw that the North was gaining congressional seats and they'd lose the election, that's when they decided to go out to protect their institution. And they did and wrote this the same constitution, except he added that the foundation was slavery of this constitution. And so that, but even then Lincoln was not concerned about the foundation of slavery in the constitution. He was concerned about keeping those states that had seceded in the union. Uh, Lincoln always said that they had the right to secede. A state had a right to make that decision, but because it was a contract made in 1787, uh, the states had to had to have the agreement before they seceded of the other states to their secession. They did not get it. They just went out. Uh, Douglas was in, this, in a sense the same way. He believed the founders had established slavery and had put it on a path to extinction. Uh, his, his belief was a constitutional belief uh, where Lincoln was more of a declaration guy. You know, Lincoln once said, I never had a political thought that didn't start with the Declaration of Independence. Douglas, who had been this great lawyer, Supreme Court justice at the age of 27, his perspective was entirely from what is law. And, you know, he, he complained about the House divided speech because Lincoln said, this country will become either one thing or the other, free or slave. And Douglas was railing at Lincoln. You know, you've just pulled all the chits off the table, Mr. Lincoln. And once you unsheath the sword for war, it can never be resheathed. So they both were headed in the same direction, uh, both with different uh, foundations, uh, but their friendship continued. And as you said, two Illinoisans, both Western men, and it was Douglas who made that third section in the country, uh, two Illinoisans came to uh, preserve the Union. I'm going to paraphrase I th what I think I heard, and uh, you can tell yeah. me I'm right. <laughs> that, uh, that apparently I think both Douglas and Lincoln were of one mind that the preservation of the Union was the most important thing. Yes. And that they uh, they approached it, perhaps, that ultimate goal from somewhat different mm -hmm. directions, but that they both tended to think this nation should stand as one and go into the future as one nation. Uh, and to the extent that we have slavery or other issues, but certainly slavery was the issue that they were both wrestling with, uh, that we need to keep it together as a, as one unified nation and then continue to deal with this uh, issue as we go along. Um, as we said, when, it, when we got to 1860, it was coming to a head. Mm -hmm. And so we had the Civil War and then we had the rest. Uh, before we close out, we've already gone a little bit over an hour, which we appreciate. And you and I, I'm sure, could probably go three or four hours. But uh, <laughs> yes, certainly. Uh, so let me bring up your your first uh, book, uh, Reg, was um, this one, Stephen Douglas. It's already mm -hmm. out. 
the Political Apprenticeship, 1833 to 1843, your second volume is uh, called what? Uh, and when is that going to be out? Stephen A. Douglas, Western Man, 18, uh, 1844 to 1850. And McFarland, my publisher, will issue it later this year. They've had it for two months and uh, they're putting it together and printing it. It's supposed to be out later this year. And your, uh, your third volume then would pick up the story and go, I, I suppose, until when? When would it end? 1861 with the passing of Douglas? Yes. It's Douglas's death, June 3rd, 1861. And the title, the working title is Stephen A. Douglas and Union. And uh, hopefully that, that expresses the entire thrust of the book. It, it is a much more closer, a much closer examination of Stephen Douglas's perception of slavery. And um, hopefully I'll make the point. Um, and and I, I want readers to make the point. My job as a reporter is not to make the point or provide the opinion that they should listen to, but to provide the information on which they can make their own decisions. And, uh, and, and that's been sort of my thrust through my first two books. Uh, you know, a lot of biographers become uh, uh, very empathetic and sympathetic and, and really affection, affectionate toward their subjects. I've tried to keep myself from affection for Stephen Douglas. I greatly appreciate him for really building the union uh, at a time when the central government really had no use for the West. They didn't want it because they figured it was too far. Douglas's answer to that were the great railroads that he built uh, and started that ran from Chicago south to New Orleans and, and uh, west to uh, Oregon and, and uh, California. That was his answer for the communication. He believed that if we have a country that expansive, we have to provide a way for people to be able to connect with their own government, which was in Washington, D.C. So, so the idea is that um, my goal is to give people enough information, and it's there. I found it. I didn't expect three books. I figured I'd write one, but the one became three. Give people enough information to let them make their own decision about what I believe um, was a great figure in the 19th century and in American history. And if people want to buy your books, where where would they find them? Uh, they can find them on Amazon. I noticed uh, the other day I was looking and eBay is selling them a lot more inexpensively. So, uh, you know, my, my publisher is an academic publisher. And when, when I learned the price of the first book, which was $45, I called and said, you know, I don't buy books that cost that much. And the marketing gal said to me, she said, are you a professor? And I said, no, I'm just the author. And she said, well, you are not our market. So I, I know now why universities charge so much for their books is because their publishers charge a lot for their books. But McFarland has told me the book sold well and that's uh, they're happy to, to publish the second one. And um, uh, so to answer your question, Terry, they can buy it on amazon.com. It's, uh, uh, they can download it to Kindle uh, less expensively, and it's available through indie books, aid books, and uh, you know, used books through uh, through other sources. So, eBay, like eBay. You had already known a lot about um, history before you started this project. You had read, as you said, extensively. Uh, I guess Sandberg's uh, Life of Lincoln. Uh, mm -hmm. As you got into this, um, I presume you you probably discovered any number of things that you found surprising and maybe yes. perhaps some of it we haven't even uh, been made aware of yet because you haven't finished your three volumes uh, in fact the well, second the third, one isn't uh, even out as yet so the second will be out and i think you'll find a number of surprises in it which i was surprised to find when i was reading the congressional globe uh one for i'll give you one example uh douglas in acting as a prosecutor sort of is on the floor and he's asking about the election uh, in New York, had New York's electoral votes uh, gone to Lewis Cass, Lewis Cass would have been elected in 1848. And, and Douglas found out that um, Seward did something that in a sense was fraudulent. And Douglas acts as a prosecutor and starts running down this series of questions. And Seward is not recognizing what Douglas is leading to. And at the end of this kind of inquisition, this uh, series of questions, uh, Douglas, Douglas points out that, uh, I think it was Taylor, yes, it was uh, Zachary Taylor was elected then, 1848, 
Douglas, Douglas uh, points out that Taylor was elected fraudulently and also claims that Seward also was elected fraudulently. And if you read what I read, and you'll read it in my book, you'll see exactly what it's talking about. A, a tremendous surprise that Douglas found this issue. Uh, I also, th there are also several other surprises. I love serendipity, what I call serendipitous finds in history. There will be, I, I'm sure you'll read a lot of other surprises as I was surprised in that second book. I've written the epilogue to my third book, which is the, which I consider probably the greatest find that I've made in my tour through history here in the past 10 years. And uh, I think it'll surprise a lot of historians um, for, for what I found. And, and um, so I'm going to let you salivate on that one. <laughs> to be continued. Well, uh, you know, yes. this is the thing. Uh, I have said to you privately, I'll say it to the public, uh, we, we've gone an hour and 15 minutes here. Television is a thin medium. We, we, it doesn't hold up mm -hmm. well, the myriad of details. Um, but I think we've done quite a lot here in, in this delving yes. into the life of Douglas. Uh, they should, people who want more, obviously can go out and, and get your book. And if you're going to live in Illinois and want to know the history, a better history of the state of Illinois, but also of the nation. And again, these are not insignificant people. This isn't just like reading about the history of Arkansas or something. I mean, this is, as we said, Lincoln and Douglas, as we have discussed over the last hour, their lives intersected, and uh, each of them were playing throughout uh, the decades of their careers uh, significant roles that led to the issue of slavery, the issue of the Civil War, but also westward expansion, and how the nation that we live in today came to be. So that's, I, I think, why I'm, I always try to leave for the viewers, why should I care? I think that's the reason mm -hmm. why you should care and to have a greater understanding of, uh, again, to put context into some of these issues that we uh, are dealing with today in our own time. Um, so with that, Reg, uh, we will let you go, but we appreciate it. And uh, I'll look forward, if we can, perhaps to uh, touch base with you uh, at different times. You know, I'm always sorry when we go to some events, whether it's at the Lincoln Presidential Library or other things that we've taped along the way, uh, that so many times I, I look around at the audience and go, where are the younger people? You know, it seems like uh, mm -hmm. that everyone, the youngest people in the room are like 55 years old. And I, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish more people would fall in love with history as I think you and I have. Uh, and revel in some of the lessons that we can learn and be and apply to our own our own thinking. Uh, it, mm -hmm. We need to fertilize or fertilize our own thoughts and get out of the incestuous thoughts that we have just from um, thinking amongst ourselves or with a small circle of friends. And I think that's what books, as you uh, have written and bring to us to consider, can open up some doors and some new thoughts and and help us weigh the issues in our own time. So we thank you so much for um, for all the time and, and the effort that you've had in creating this three volumes. Um, and hopefully we can talk to you again soon. Look forward to it. Thanks a lot, Terry. Appreciate being with you. Thank you, Rudge. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.